So I was asked to say something about the significance of the Reformation Jubilee 2017 for the future of the churches. And I think that's very important because we do not just need to look back 1517, 1520, 1521 and so on. But I think we need to use the occasion of the Reformation Jubilee to look forward. Who do we want to be as Lutheran churches in the future? Um, I have 10 examples. I like to make either three or 10 points, so that's just my systematic. Uh, it's nothing important. So the first point is we need this time a critical look back. In 1617, the Reformation Jubilee served as confessional self-assurance. It was right to go your own way as Lutheran church. And then started the national uh, remembrance, 1817, after the Battle of the Nations near Leipzig in 1813, Germany became a nation and the nation needs a national hero. And so Martin Luther became the national hero. Um, I don't have time enough, but interesting enough also for Roman Catholics and for Jews. He became the hero of the German nation and not just a Lutheran hero, so to say. And then 1917, after 1883, Luther's 400th birthday has been celebrated widely in the world, especially the Americans, uh, uh, descendants of German, Danish, probably Icelandic and others. Uh, they were celebrating all over the United States, Luther's 400th birthday. And then 1917, Reformation Jubilee, nobody wanted to celebrate with the Germans. You know, it was World War I and uh, they got very distant to Germans. So Germans celebrated their Luther as the consoler of our nation. It was very emotional, the celebration 1917. In 1933 in Germany, when the Na National Socialists seized power, Luther at his 450th birthday was surrounded by the aura of a God-given great leader. And there would only be one leader that's even more than Luther, Adolf Hitler. And then the only Reformation Jubilee I ever uh, lived through was 1983, Luther's 500th birthday. And there in Germany, we had a great struggle. Was Luther a West German or an East German? Mm -hmm. It was a, a great discussion. And in East Germany, up to then, he had been the servant of the princess, you know, and Münzer, he was the, the hero of East Germany. But suddenly East Germany needed money in those days. So suddenly he became Luther, a pre-revolutionary figure. And so they celebrated Luther, and in West Germany, people were astonished and only had a, a congress of historians, nothing else, in 1983. So we must be quite sensitive to the fact that those anniversaries are tricky points in history. How will generations after us look back at 2017? Will it be seen, seen as an attempt to gain attraction to the Christian faith? One point is sure, in Germany, at least, we don't have a Luther cult these days, no cult around um, Luther. We see 1517 now as a symbolic date and see that the Reformation was driven by many people. I mean, already um, Jan Hus, a hundred year before, years before that, Zwingli, Calvin, and uh, so on. And uh, we can say that the Reformed are very much uh, part of our celebration this time. If you have been to Wittenberg, you will have seen the Swiss pavilion uh, that's very large, and so uh, we see that the reform Reformation um, in Switzerland is part of the Reformation. It's a broad process, and when we started thinking about the Jubilee, there were two points that were extremely important. This thing is bothering me with my hands. Okay. Um, huh? Okay. Uh, they were extremely important. Uh, we said, one point, it will be not nationalistic. This time we will celebrate in an international, broad, widely open manner. And I think this is working right now in Wittenberg. The city is full, full of people from all over the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, even Iceland, so to say. It's very international. And on the other hand, it will be not anti-Catholic, but ecumenical. And so it's not only the Reform, but also the, um, the Roman Catholics that are participating, but the Baptists are participating, the Mennonites, the Methodists, and the Orthodox. So this time we have an international ecumenical reformation jubilee. And for me, that's a first key point. Second point certainly is ecumenism. It's the first anniversary after having experienced ecumenical movement as Lutheran churches. And so we cannot celebrate against the Roman Catholics anymore. The reformation era changed everything. 
the Roman Catholic Church of today is not the same church with which Martin Luther and the other reformers struggled. But we can say um, that also in, already in the Council of Trent, they said farewell to the practice of selling indulgence for money. And the Second Vatican mm. Council introduced the mass in the language of the people, something that the reformers really Uh, um, demanded. So uh, we can say that today the Roman Catholic Church is no longer the enemy. The suffragan Roman Catholic Bishop of Hamburg declared that today Luther's 95 Theses would be accepted by any Roman Catholic. And if you read through them, I think this is pretty much true. Uh, uh, what Luther demanded in 1517 is practiced now by the Roman Catholic Church. And in Augsburg 1999, The Roman Catholic Church, Vatican Council, and the Lutheran World Federation signed the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification by faith alone, and so asserted that the condemnations issued in the 16th century no longer hit us uh, in being the church in, uh, in our theology today. And actually, two weeks ago, the World Alliance of Reformed Churches signed that treaty as well. So that's also a very important ecumenical Step. For me, it's very clear that there are still differences with regard to the Pope, um, the situation in which you uh, accept Mary as saving souls, uh, with regard to celibacy, with regard to the ministry of women. There are differences, but the differences are not predominant anymore, but predominant is what unites us and not what divides us. I think uh, in Lent 2017 in Germany, we had an important step. We had an ecumenical worship service for the healing of the memories, and we granted each other forgiveness for what we've done to each other. I mean, in Germany, we had a 30-year war, almost a European war, we can say, over those differences. And so there was also a confession of guilt, what our divisions have done to the world. This has sent, set the tone for the Reformation Jubilee and Cardinal Kasper, who came to Wittenberg uh, the beginning of June, he gave a speech and he said 1999 was an important step so that the Reformation Jubilee 2017 can be a kairos for the ecumenical movement. For me, that was a very important sentence in times where we also have um, difficult, especially ethical discussions in Germany with the Roman Catholic Church. I think right now the ethical differences are more important uh, um, when people from outside look at our churches than, uh, than the dogmatic um, differences, especially concerning homosexuality, for instance. So that's the second point. We need an ecumenical dimension um, in the Reformation Jubilee. The third point, 2017, is the first anniversary of the publication of the 95 Theses since the Holocaust and the failure of Christians in Germany with regard to the Jews in the National Socialist era has triggered a learning process. We discussed that especially in the year Reformation and, um, and Tolerance. And I can say it was a bitter discussion for many to see that this hero, Martin Luther, had to step down because he was an anti-Judaist. There's no way uh, um, not to see that and not to discuss that. I mean, some historians say we have to regard him as an anti-Semitist even because he said, never trust a Jew. And that means it's not just a faith dimension, but it's also a, a dimension with regard to the Jews as such. His hatred towards Jews, especially in his older years, had the source in his anger that Jews would not read the Hebrew part of the Bible as pointing towards Jesus as the Messiah. That is an explanation, I think, but it's not an excuse. So it was important that before starting to celebrate the Reformation, our church confronted itself with that terrible heritage and um, that, to see that this was used by the Nazis in order to argue murdering the Jews. Today, the Evangelical Church in Germany says whoever attacks Jews attacks us. And after 60 years of Christian-Jewish dialogue, we can see that the Reformation Church is capable of learning. We are a learning church. And our synod in 2015 officially distanced itself from Luther's writings on the Jews. 
the reformers themselves said that the church must always be reforming itself. And I think this is a decisive point where we have to change. This is a challenge. And the new challenge today is with regard to the Muslims. Although Luther ranted against the Turks, he never met one in his life, though, we must say. But today, in Germany especially, we live together in one country. At the same time, we know that Christians in Muslim societies are persecuted. We need dialogue and we need theological dialogue. A learning process uh, um, that is probably what a Reformation church especially need today, I would say. And uh, we started that in Wittenberg. We had a whole week on um, interreligious dialogue. And for me, one of the moving days was a Friday. And I don't know whether you saw this House of One, which we rebuilt in the World Exhibition on Reformation. This is a project in Berlin. Uh, in Berlin, we want to build in the Petri Place, and I hope we have the money until 2019. If there's a millionaire around who wants to give some, I'm always looking for one. Um, and we will have a synagogue, a church, and a mosque, and in between them, a large space of community, meeting each other, eating with each other, discussing with each other. And we built that en miniature, so to say, in Wittenberg, in small, just with wood. And on, on a Friday in that week, in the morning, we had a Christian morning prayer. Then we had a, a Muslim Friday lunchtime prayer with Muslims from all over the town coming. And in the evening, we had Shabbat Shalom uh, in the same place. And for me, that was a sign of where we have to go to. We need dialogue. And if we talk about where are we going in the future, I think that will be a contribution to peace in the world so that religion contributes to peace and not any longer um, to war and violence. Fourth point, faith language in a secular age. 2017, we celebrate in an age of secularization. I mean, Margaret <coughs> gave me the figures of Iceland yesterday. You're in a different situation uh, um, on your island, I guess, in your nation. Uh, if you go to Luther's birthplace today, Eisleben, 7% of the populations are member of a church. Mm -hmm. And when I told that story in Tanzania, the bishops in Tanzania, the Lutheran bishops said, what do the other 93% believe in? Mm -hmm. And I said, nada. Nothing. They say, we have no relation to faith at all. And that is a challenge. How do you talk about your faith in an era where many people have no clue what faith in God could be? I think the churches of the Reformation should confront this challenge head on. After all, they developed their spiritual life from the Bible. Luther's monastic experience was important. His Bible study brought the theological insight and at the same time, he found a language that touched people, a language for the people and with the people. And even if it's debatable how many sole um, there were in the time of the Reformation, I think they can be a key uh, how to talk about the essence of our faith. Solus Christus, through Christ alone. For me, that's also very important in interfaith dialogue. Because we cannot pray to Christ with Muslims and Jews. There's an essential difference. For Jews, he's one of the rabbis of his time. And for Muslims, he's one of the prophets and uh, Muhammad, a greater prophet than Jesus. So Christ at the center is very important. So like Grazia, by grace alone. God's grace alone justifies your life. And that's very important over against all this justification we have right now. Uh, by work, by well, um, well-being, uh, justification, by wealth also, or by being skinny, uh, that justifies their life. Many, many girls in Germany are sick about that. Justification by grace. Sola Scriptura. The Bible will still be the key point of, uh, of relating. I don't know about Iceland, but in Germany we have some people who discuss, you know, bringing Tai Chi, Qi Gong, all that uh, Zen Buddhism to the church. And then you must say, but if it doesn't relate to the scripture, uh, I have a difficulty. And by faith alone, that's crucial. How do we transport in a secular age what faith can mean for the life of the people? Many people in our achievement-oriented societies do not understand what Luther's question about a gracious God means, but they are worried whether their life has purpose. 
what if I can't keep up because I don't have a job, I don't earn enough, I don't look good enough. The promise of life that Luther found, we have to translate into a secular age. And I think that's a great challenge. I can only talk about Germany, I don't know about Iceland, but uh, maybe you can um, connect to that in your context somehow. The fifth point, women. It's the first anniversary upon which the vast majority of the churches of the Reformation um, have accepted women in the ordained ministry and even as bishops, as in Iceland. I'm very pleased to see that. Um, for Martin Luther, it became more and more clear, and he had a theological point in that, that baptism is the sacramental central event. And God promises in baptism human beings divine grace, love, care, and the sense for meaning, uh, fullness of life. And all the failures of our life cancel that out. If we go back to baptism, we, have, we need no repentance, but we are kept by God, baptizatus sum. That's what Luther reminded himself of. I am baptized in the great crisis of his life. And Luther has declared, whoever emerged from baptism is priest, bishop, pope. So we can say it took us 500, 450 years to realize that women are baptized as well. Uh, but at least 76.4% of all the Lutheran churches in the world have realized that. And I think we should, um, we should struggle with the others. Uh, I, I told you I was in New, New Zealand and Australia don't ordain women, the Lutheran churches. I was... Uh, Really upset by that. Then we have Poland. They just missed it by two votes in the Senate, the two-thirds majority. And then when we have Latvia, uh, where they took back ordaining women. And I think we should discuss that because in the view of the world, uh, if people are asked in Germany, we had a so survey, what is Protestant? One of the first answers was they have women in ministry. So I think it's a sign of, uh, of our theology, not, not of zeitgeist, but of Theology. I mean, we have some time, so I tell you that story. When I became head of the Council of the EKD, the Russian Orthodox Church skipped relationships with the EKD, cut relationships, because they said if, the, if a woman is the head of the church, we cannot relate to that church because it has adapted to zeitgeist. And so I wrote back, I don't know whether they write the read the letter of a woman, but I wrote back and I said, we did not adapt to zeitgeist but this is Lutheran baptism theology we are practicing. And then um, we must say that a celibate life in the times of Martin Luther was regarded as being more respected before God, the direct way to heaven. For many reformers, the step towards marriage was a theological signal that the life with sex or sexuality, with a family, with raising children, uh, with working with your hands, is good life before God, the life in the world, not the life in monastery. Luther says, I don't see any sense in living in a monastery. You have to be a responsible Christian out there in the world with a beruf, you know, with a calling. Uh, um, and that can be the wife, that can be the mother, that can be uh, uh, the worker, but it's out there the good life before, before God. Ute Gause, a professor of uh, Reformation history, explains that it was a symbolic action that, I quote her, wanted to make clear something elementary for the Reformation, the new faith turning towards the world, including the pleasures of the senses. And that's why uh, we don't demand celibacy, but we say you can live a celibate life, certainly as a, uh, as a Lutheran pastor, but uh, life with a family, with children, uh, being a couple, that's part of the good life before God, and that's not uh, a life uh, to be neglected. This had a lot of consequences. For instance, in the first church regulations drawn up by the reformers, midwives now are valued as custodians of the church. And a woman who gave birth was no longer regarded as unclean, but should be cared for and looked after. And incidentally, Luther could be tremendously modern in this respect. There's a question, and I like this quote so much that I brought it this morning. He is asked whether a grown man makes, makes himself a laughing stock if he washes diapers or nappies. I don't know what you say here. So a short quote from Luther's answer. I quote, when a man goes ahead and washes diapers or performs some other mean task for his children, 
and someone ridicules him as an effeminate idiot, though this man is acting in Christian faith, my dear fellow, you tell me, who of the two is most keenly ridiculing the other? God, with all his angels and creatures, is smiling, not because the man is washing diapers, but because he's doing so in Christian faith. Those who sneer at him and see only the task, but not the faith, they are ridiculing God. They are the biggest fools on earth. Indeed, they are only ridiculing themselves. With all their cleverness, they are nothing but the devil's fools, unquote. Yeah. That means it's not the nonsense spoken by others that matters. What matters is that I know what I'm doing in faith, in responsibility before God. It's not so important what I'm doing, but that what I'm doing, I'm doing in Christian faith. And it's important that we are all part of the one creation and caring for life in our relationships. So I think we should value that, uh, the development in our ministry that women and men can be uh, in all uh, ministries in our church. And also you must be our, our synods. I guess that's the same here. If you look at the Roman Catholic synod, synod it's exclusively elderly men meeting in Rome. Our synods have young and old, men and women, lay and ordained. So the church is led by many, and that's a very Lutheran, uh, Lutheran short, um, very Lutheran, what do you say, a distinction. Six point overcoming divisions. And we talked about that yesterday. It's the first anniversary after uh, the Leuenberg Agreement. And I just learned that you're not part of the Leuenberg Agreement. I must say, I thought you were. Um, but we must say that the Reformation movement itself was subject uh, uh, to splits time and again. And we still are. I think the worst thing is that today the Lutheran Church is split over ethical issues, not theological. They are very often non-theological factors in those debates. And you know that in the United States, the division now of the ELCA by the question whether homosexuals can be, can be pastors, that's bitter. And also the split with many of the African Lutheran churches who cut uh, links to the European churches, like with the Church of Sweden, the Mekane Jesus Church in Ethiopia. They cut the links to the church that founded them once. Um, they haven't cut with us. We are one of the founding members of the Ethiopian church too. I don't know why yet, because we also accept homosexuals in, in, um, in our church being pastors uh, and being part of the congregations. But I would, that's another discussion, but I would like to discuss whether that's really a theological or whether that's a non-theological factor. And when I was in, one last story, but when I was in the United States at a dinner, uh, Thanksgiving two years ago, I sat next to a Lutheran and he said, uh, uh, well, every time he disagrees with his church, he just founds a new church. And this is the third one he founded because, you know, he just says, I don't agree with you anymore. So I found a new church and that's Protestant too. And I think we have to, to have need, we need a learning process to say splitting up is not always... Uh, a, a good sign to the world and uh, whether you like the Roman Catholic Church or not, they kept together a world church with all the divisions in the Roman Catholic Church. They are not unified. They're very different inside, but they kept this world church together. So in Europe in 1973, we finally had the Leuenberg Agreement, a strong signal that such divisions can be overcome despite the theological difference, especially with regard to the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Reformed Lutheran and United Churches um, agreed that they recognize each other mutually as churches along with their ministerial orders and so can celebrate Holy uh, Communion together. We talked about it yesterday, whether this might be a model for Lutherans and uh, Roman Catholics. I suggested that to Cardinal Kaspar in a, in a debate and he, he said this is a minimalist, minimalist ecumenism. <laughs> And we cannot, uh, um, we cannot accept that. Differences necessarily uh, are divisive. But I would say we have to discuss what models of unity do we have uh, in, our, in our head, so to say, in our mind. And for me, unity doesn't mean uh, it's all unified. I would think that's very boring. I think it's interesting how Orthodox Roman Catholics, Mennonites, Reformed, uh, um, celebrate their liturgy, but 
the important point is that it doesn't divide us. Differences can be creative and differences are necessary to think about your own identity, but it doesn't mean uh, that you have to be divided. So we can today celebrate the Eucharist together with the Reformed, um, those who are part of the Leuenberg Concordia and uh, in the Meissen Declaration of 1988 um, with the visit of, after the visit of Archbishop of Canterbury, Robert Runcie, um, it was stated Lutherans and Anglicans have never denied the one, one another the name church. And in the end, the EKD and the Church of England recognized each other as churches belonging to the one holy Catholic apostolic church of Jesus Christ and committed themselves to take all possible steps to closer fellowship. So today, um, the Anglicans say they are sister reformation and there's also the Paul War Agreement. Uh, so there we have uh, an overcoming of division. And I think if we talk about the future, we need to overcome division without evening out the differences. And I think that's the challenge. And last year I had a, I had a Eucharist service in Basel, Ball, in Switzerland. And, you know, we sing the liturgy, even if they don't have an altar. So I sang the liturgy and did what I would do in the Lutheran church. And then they said, oh, Bishop Kaysman, you're quite Roman Catholic, aren't you? <laughs> and so it's, it's different, but it's interesting. Seventh point, education. It's the first anniversary uh, in an age when the historical critical method of biblical exegesis has been widely, not overall, recognized. Martin Luther, in practicing the freedom of a Christian, demanded that every man and every woman should be able to confess their own faith in the triune God and affirm his or her own faith. A precondition for a mature faith was that people could read the Bible and would understand from, for themselves. So he created the small catechism as a sort of confession for daily use. In Germany, many uh, confirmation classes hide because they had to learn that by heart. But what Luther wanted uh, was achieved. They had an answer. What is this? What does it mean, the Ten Commandments? Uh, um, for instance, uh, the Lord's Prayer. So that was Luther's sort of teaching didactics to have an answer. Equality and opportunity in education. Luther was convinced that faith means educated faith. And that was his own experience. He read the Bible, he read Augustine, and from there he had his uh, a strong conviction that made him strong enough uh, to even face the Pope and the Kaiser. So he translated the Bible into the German language. He created, actually, the German language. Uh, I cannot really explain that to you, but he created words that had not been there before in translating the Bible. And he says it's not just translating, it's Dolmetschen. Uh, and there's this uh, one um, letter he writes about Dolmetschen. And I think it's so interesting that he says, um, you are saved by faith alone. And then critiques say, but alone is not in the, in the Greek text, in the original text. And then he says, uh, they are like uh, um, cattle looking at a closed door, if they don't say that you have to say alone in order to understand that, to make understandable what's meant. So he's a very creative um, translator, and uh, there are many um, incidents like Lückenbüßer. I cannot translate that, but it's a word, to think of a word like that is Lückenbüßer. Uh, um, that's very great. And uh, his Hebrew was not so good. Melanchthon always had to help him with the Hebrew. And then they had to translate uh, something from the uh, um, third book of Moses, of the regulations. And so they had a sheep slaughtered before them. And so the man who slaughtered the sheep had to tell all the terms, what it means in German, so to find out. Uh, what are the Germans' word, the German words? So they are very, they were very creative translators. And for the Old Testament, they took twelve years. Mm -hmm. And after the twelve years, they went on and on and on redoing the translation. And in uh, his final days, Luther says, "You never can stop translating the Bible." And we just have a revised uh, version uh, for 2017. And there were 70 people working six years. And in many cases, they went back to Luther's translation. And they took back the revisions of the last uh, 100 years because they said Luther is much clearer in his German language. Oh, that's 
not in my manuscript, but it's interesting, <laughs> I think, this translation business. And all the reformers underline the importance of education. Melanchthon, passionate teacher, the teacher of the Germans. Martin Buzer is regarded as, so to say, the doctor of the church. Zwingli learned Greek in order to be able to read the original of the New Testament edited by Erasmus of Rotterdam. He owned what was, for that time, the huge number privately, 100 books. And in 1510, he founded a Latin grammar school in his parish. And then there was the Geneva College, college uh, founded by John Calvin, which took reform, reformed education to many regions of Europe. This is still essential for the Reformation, being able to think, reflect, speculate, understand, and ask questions. And if I'm asked what is uh, uh, necessary for the future, we live in an age where fundamentalism is growing again. Muslim fundamentalism, but also Jewish, Christian, Hindu fundamentalism is growing these days. And a fundamentalist faith doesn't like questions. Fundamentalists say, you believe what you are told and don't ask questions. Don't you dare ask questions and even uh, believe it or die. Uh, but Reformation faith says, ask questions. Think for yourselves. Read for yourself. That's why Luther ordered uh, the princes of the regions uh, to found schools for every boy and girl. That was revolutionary. Every girl should also be able To read. Today we can say that the study of the Bible includes an awareness of the origins of the biblical books and the application of the historic critical exegesis. And that's something we have to debate with some of our partner churches, with some of the Pentecostal churches, and some of the very evangelical churches. It is not a challenge to my faith to understand what, why there are two creation Uh, stories in the first book of Moses. It is not a challenge to my faith to understand why there are four Gospels and what time they are written and that Paul probably wrote his letters earlier than the Gospels were written down. I think it's interesting. And I think Luther would love to know what we know today. The Bible is the book of our faith, but we can read it historic critically. And I think that's a challenge for the future uh, too. Three more points. Eight is freedom, the Reformation, will be the first anniversary 2017 um, where in Germany and many nations of the world there's a clear separation of church and state. And I must say, if you know some of the German history, it was the Lutherans who were really very sorry when the Kaiser stepped down in 1918. They wanted their Kaiser, uh, their Kaiser back because actually they liked this. The, the head of the state is the head of the church. But we must say that today we can see as a central achievement of the Reformation that faith and reason can remain alongside each other. And with the Enlightenment, we have the freedom of faith. Luther demanded freedom of his faith, but he didn't grant the freedom of faith to all the others. You know, he said, my faith is the right faith. Um, so today we would accept that we live in countries where there is freedom of religion. You can believe in my way, in another way, or not believe. So this freedom has also political consequences. After um, the Lutherans usually were those who told, obey the state, whoever is the head of the state. That's some of Luther's teaching. In Germany, we learned the hard way that during the Nazi period, those who were in the resistance movement were closer to the true faith than those who just obeyed the state. And that's something we also learned in the times of the GDR. Um, when the churches in the GDR, especially the Protestant churches, opened their doors for the critique towards the state with regard to peace, justice, integrity of creation, there was a lot of critique in East Germany, but also from West Germany, saying, is this not ruining the balance between church and state? Isn't this endangering the church if so many political issues are debated in the church? And in the end, the lesson was that the church especially contributed to a peaceful revolution. And the call, no violence, was brought from the churches in East Berlin, in Leipzig, in Dresden, towards the streets. So it was a very important political role and prophetic role, I would say, of the churches of those times. So the freedom uh, of a Christian can also mean to be resistant within the state. 
Ninth point, the media. Sure, the reformer had deep political insight and great theological ideas, but would Luther have been so successful if he had not been able to use the media of his time? On the one hand, the book printing now was available and Luther's thoughts were widely and soon spread. And he wrote in German and briefly. That was uh, uh, rather ridiculed by his scientific colleagues. What can be a good idea that's not formulated in Latin and long sentences. Luther wrote German and short. And we must uh, um, try to see that now, if the thoughts are in German and short and they are printed all over, people can discuss. It's a participation that's suddenly possible. Women and men can discuss with others. And if you have been in the panorama in Wittenberg, I hope you have been in the Azizi panorama, uh, you can see that there's suddenly a women, woman is standing there and reading aloud and people start to discuss uh, uh, what's read in the thesis that are published um, of Luther. Of all that was published in German in the 16th century, the whole century, one third is from the pen of Luther, one third of anything that's published in German. So he wrote a lot and his biographer Heinz Schilling writes that the reformer had an outstanding literary talent I quote him, through the power of his language and the creative imaginations of his images and argumentation, Luther was fit for the star of the first media age, unquote. So also Luther's thoughts could no longer be deleted from the world. You know, Jan Hus wrote a book and they burned it and so it was gone. But now it's printed so fast that the censorship cannot really ban the books because they are printed in thousands. Suddenly they are all over the place and brought to all places. The book production went up and Luther's three great writings of the year 1520, all above the translation of the Bible, reached gigantic editions and the single page prints are found in a large audience. Soon the opponents' pamphlets followed too though, but we must say that around the Reichstag in Worms, that was actually the highlight the papal scholars were still struggling in warmth uh, in order to <coughs> evaluate what had happened. But Lutherans were pampering pamphlets all over the place saying, here I stand, I cannot help it, God help me, amen, that's what Luther did. And so this was quoted all over while they were still trying to figure out what had happened. For me, that's an example and a challenge for us today to use the new media. We have to use the internet uh, we have internet uh, uh, counseling. We need to be as churches alert for the new media and also the social media, but we have to be critical because social media can be very unsocial. And in a time of fake news, the church has to stand up for truth news. Uh, that's very important in these times that you can trust what comes from the church and that you can believe in what is um, in the media uh, produced by the church. But that's a challenge for us today to use them, but to use them in a critical mode. And my last and final point, globalization. I already started with this. We celebrate in a global perspective. We live in a globalized world. Actually, if we look at the history, that was already true in the 16th century, but not for Martin Luther. The Emperor Charles V, um, heading the council in Worms, 1522. He was striving for reform of the whole empire. He was fluent in Spanish, in French. He knew about the new dimensions uh, in what we call now Latin America. He was, was discussing, discussing the Turkish threat by Sultan Suleiman. He was uh, uh, discussing the, the revolution, the social revolution in Valencia, Britain, France, Italy. That was all on the scene. And here comes this Professor Monk from Wittenberg, who is very limited in his views of the world. He had been to Rome once and then Bavaria was the farthest he has ever gone. Heinz Schilling, one more quote says, the world view of the reformer remained a continental one to his death. He was rarely touched by the emerging new worlds. And yet we must say, the Reformation was a European event. It was not a German, it was a European event, which very soon took an international proportion. Today, the Reformation has become, as LWF's General Secretary Martin Junge said, 
World Citizen, Weltbürgerin. The fastest growing Lutheran churches exist in Tanzania and Ethiopia. We are a church across national borders, and I think this is a very special challenge in Europe today. We don't define ourselves nationalistic anymore, but we are church across national borders. That's a very new conscience we only gained in the last decades. Being a church with cultural differences, but with one faith and one confession, that's a clear sign towards the future. And as a last story, we see how our, our parishes, we, we, we look for renewal of our parishes in Germany, and we need more spirituality and more uh, uh, lively worship. And then suddenly you have interesting incidents. The parish in Hanover I belong to has a new custodian for the parish, and he's from Ghana with his three children, wife and three children. And he's been there since several years, and that changed the parish because he's standing every morning at the door in his Ghanaian way, and he says, oh, Margaret, how are you? And how's your husband, your wife, your children, blah, 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 blah. And, and people like it, even in Hanover, where, where they're quite stiff. Yeah? <laughs> and they like it, and it changes the mood of the church, and maybe renewal comes from that side, God knows. So... In the end, the gospel can only be preached with humor, the reformer Martin Luther already knew. And um, so I want to tell you that even German Lutherans have some humor. Uh, in Germany, we have, uh, I think people always think we don't have, uh, we have a production of a Playmobil Luther. <laughs> And the interesting thing is, uh, you know, I was supposed to present that and I already had booked the flight to Nuremberg and then suddenly, uh, this is not for the journalists, but then the EKD called me and said, oh, Margot, we don't know, uh, maybe you better don't go because then they will say we make Luther small or something and this can be a flop. So this thing has been produced more than a million times now and it's, uh, it's a real what you can say. Uh, it's, it's Luther in the midst of society, I would say. Uh, I gave one of them to my, one of my uh, sons-in-law last Christmas, uh, and they couldn't come at my, because they had just had the second child. And so I called on Christmas, and I said to my uh, granddaughter, so what did you get? Oh, a house for puppets, you know? And I said, oh, and who's living in the house? And she said, Martin Luther, because you put it in. So, so for the two bishops, I brought a Martin Luther. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank <laughs> you.